Well, this is a talk that's not in the notes, but has to be filled in because holidays didn't break up any classes. It's a talk on roughly how do we know what we know if indeed we know it. It's a very old topic. It's been argued about for a thousand years or more. And in philosophy, it's given a technical word, epistemology, the science of knowledge. Now, I'm going to begin very far back with primitive tribes and point out to you they all have a creation myth of the world. In ancient Japan, somebody stirred up the mud and the drops fell off and those were the islands. Each primitive tribe has their ones. The Israelis had the belief that uh, God worked for six days and then he got tired and that was it. These are all of the same type, and though while they're quite varied, they all attempt to account for why is the world there. I will call them theology, because there is no way of appealing to other than the gods did it. They did what they did, and that's the way the world is. About 600 BC, some Greeks in ancient Greece began to ask the question more detailed. Just what is the world made of? What are the parts? And also try to approach it rationally rather than theologically. And as you know, they had earth, fire, water, and air, and they had various other things, and they had various beliefs. And slowly out of that has come modern belief of what we know. But it's always perplexed people, and even the Greeks wondered about how we knew what we knew. And you remember when I discussed mathematics? The Greeks believed that geometry, which was mathematics to them, was certain, absolutely sure knowledge. But that a guy named Klein wrote a book, uh, Mathematics, The Loss of Certainty. And most mathematicians will admit that uh, there is no truth in mathematics. There is consistency with a given set of reasoning rules. If you change the rules, well, things are different. If you change the assumptions, things are different. There is no absolute truth beyond, well, the Ten Commandments, if you believe in the Bible. But the kind of thing we're talking about, there is nothing. It's a very vexing question. Now, you, you make various assumptions, you get various conclusions. Descartes, because he noticed how many philosophers assumed so much, backed off and said, how little can I be sure of? And he chose... I exist, therefore I am. No. He tried from that to deduce a philosophy and a coherent bunch of knowledge. It hasn't proved to be too satisfactory. So we still don't have things. Kant said, well, you are born with the certain knowledge of Euclidean geometry and so on and so on and so on. That you are born with certain knowledge which is Sure, God give it if you wish. Unfortunately, just as Kant was writing this stuff, mathematicians were producing non-Euclidean geometry, which was just as good as Euclidean geometry, if the test is consistency. So Kant's version has gone down the drain, and most everyone has gone down the drain at just how do we know what we know. Now, the topic is important because science is always being appealed to. Science has shown that. We know from science so-and-so. We know this. We know that. Do we? How sure are we? That's what I'm going to be talking about in more detail. And one way of getting at it is to remember a rule in biology. It's a technical phrase. Epist uh, let's see. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, meaning the growth of the individual from fertilized egg up to you repeats in a very schematic way the evolution behind you. Thus, as some sages claim that their gill slits appear on the surface, which gradually fade away again. And thus they assumed that that meant that we went through a stage of being fish at one point. Well, 
it's not bad. If you don't take it too seriously, it's not a bad clue as to how, if you believe evolution, it did occur. Now I'm going to push a little further and say, well, I'm going to try and look at the question, how do children learn? How do they acquire knowledge? Now it may be that they are in fact born with certain knowledge, but that's a little dubious thing. Quite dubious. So what do they do? They have certain instincts which they obey and a child begins making noises. And it makes all kinds of noise which we often call babbling. And it doesn't make much difference apparently what country they're born in, whether China or Russia or England or America, they babble pretty much the same. But depending upon the country they're in, various babblings produce various results. Thus, in this country, when a child says, Mama, a couple of times, he gets favorable responses. And so he repeats the noises. So he finds out from experience what kind of noises produce satisfactory results and which ones don't. And this goes on. Gradually builds up a supply of things. Now you remember, I've said several times, a dictionary has no first word. Every word is defined in terms of some other words, so the dictionary is circular. And you can see that the same way the child is trying to build up some consistency, it runs into trouble and finds inconsistencies and has to revise. But there is no first thing that he learns for sure. Because mama doesn't always work. He comes up therefore with quite a few confusions. And a typical one I've written down here is a well-known joke. This is part of a well-known song, and this is what a child thought was being sung. I had the same difficulty, not that particular one, but in my own life there are a couple of experiences which I now can recall, in which what I could recite and say, perfectly all right, was totally different than what other people understood by that, in particular what my parents thought. Same as that. You can see the enormity, and you can see how it happens. Well, this is what the child faces. The problem of making assumptions of what language means, and then gradually it seem to mean that, but it may take a very long time before they are corrected. In fact, it's not clear that all the misconceptions will be corrected in time. Now, you can get awful far without understanding what you're doing. I mentioned before, a friend of mine with a PhD in mathematics out of Harvard, while an undergraduate at Harvard, said he could do the delta process perfectly all right in calculus, but he really didn't understand it. He just knew how to do it. And that is true of many, many things you do. Not only bicycle riding, but skating and swimming and other things you can do, but you don't know how you do it. And knowledge is a very strange thing. Knowledge seems to be more what you can put into words, but I hesitate to say you don't know how to bicycle, even if you can't say how to do it. You just get out of bicycle, cycle. Well, knowledge is a very difficult thing this way. To summarize where I am so far, there are some people who believe we're given certain knowledge, but if you look at the situation and examine it all, you decide probably, while a child has certain innate tendencies to make noises and so on, if he's raised in China, he will learn to make a bunch of sounds to get what he wants. If he's born in Russia, he will a different bunch of sounds. If he's born in America, it will be still a different bunch of sounds. The language itself is not built in. On the contrary. The child innately can learn any language about as well as any other language. He picks it up and sorts out from the noises meaning. He has to put in the meaning. There is no first part. When you point your finger at a horse and say, horse, is that the name of the horse? Is it a quadruped? Is it the color of the horse? The child can't tell when you try to find a horse by pointing at it. But that's what you mean. He doesn't know what class to put it in. The same way with run, the verb. Run physically, but you also say when you wash some clothes, the colors run. Or you may say somebody runs for office. The child has a great deal of difficulty, but he finds 
sooner or later, many errors which are corrected. And it would appear to be that children are able to abandon ideas fairly rapidly, recognize something is wrong. But as they get older, they are less able to do so. And when we get fairly old, you can't get them to change. Now, you keep misconceptions going is evident from what you know about people who believe they're Napoleon. It doesn't matter how much evidence you produce that they're not, they believe that they are. You are aware there's a large number of people who have a great many beliefs which you don't hold, and you think their beliefs are crazy. So the idea that there is some safe way to knowledge is not quite true. Now you say, but science is careful. Huh? Let's take this business of science and ask what it really is. Somebody says, Sci a scientist knows science like a fish knows hydrodynamics. There isn't any definition of science. I discovered that for myself. I think I told you once before. Somewhere in high school, various teachers told me different things. And I could see that these things that various teachers said weren't the same. And furthermore, when I looked at what we did, that was still something different. Now, you have probably been told, you make experiments, you look at data, and you form theories. That has to be nonsense. You first have a, have a theory before you can gather the data. You can't gather random data. The color of this room, the species of next bird, and so on, expect to make any sense. You have to have some kind of a theory before you gather data. Furthermore, you can't interpret the results of the experiments you may do if you do not have a theory. Experiments are theory loaded all the way through. You have preconceived notions and you must interpret things in terms of those. Now you acquire an enormous amount of preconceived notions by osmosis. The primitive tribes tell various stories around the campfire and the children hear them and they learn the ethos of the business. If you're in a big organization, you learn how to behave by the way other people behave. It's not said, you just learn to behave properly, pretty much. Now, as you get older, I say you can't always stop. I tend to think that when I look at ladies my age, I can see a reflection of what was the fashionable dress in college, the days where they were in college. I may be kidding myself, but I tend to think so. You've all seen old hippies who are still dressing and behaving like what was a proper behavior when they were at a formative age. It's amazing how much you acquire that way which you don't know about and how difficult an old age it is to relax and set it aside and recognize it is not truth. Knowledge is a very dangerous thing. It comes with all kinds of theory. You have lots and lots of preconceptions. For example, you have some preconception of A precedes B, and A is the cause of B. Well, day follows night, invariably. Does night cause day, or day cause night? No. And the one I like so well is the height of the Potomac River is pretty well connected with the a uh, number of phone calls in the central office. The central office calls rise, the Potomac River rises. The phone calls don't call the rise. It's raining out. And that's causing people to call cabs and calling home saying, well, it's a rainy night, I'll be home late or something else like that. And the river gradually rises from the rain. The idea that you can call, use cause and effect by one preceding the other isn't really true. It requires some careful analysis and careful thinking on your part, and it can lead you wrong. Now, in the prehistory of man, man apparently assigned spirits to the trees and the rivers and the stones and so on because they couldn't account for what happened. But spirits, you see, had free will, so that you could account for it. But as time went on, we tried to restrict the spirits. If you did such and such propitiatory act, then the spirit would have to do so and so. If you did just the right things and made the right incantation, then of course the spirit of the tree would do so and so and everything would happen all right. Or if you planted by the full moon, 
then the crops would be better or something. Maybe they are. That still hangs on in our religions. We have quite a lot of, if we do the right thing, the gods or gods have to deliver the goods the way we ask. Provided, of course, we do the right things on our part. So the many gods ultimately became a single god, chiefly, although not always. Uh, the Christian god, Allah, the Mohammedan one, the Buddha, although now they have a chain of Buddhas. Uh, they are more or less coalesced into one, but we still have a lot of black magic around. We have a lot of name black magic in the form of words. If you have a son named Charles, you know if you stop and think that Charles is not the child. Charles is the name of the child, but it's not the same. Nevertheless, a lot of black magic goes on with the use of the name. I write the name of the person down, and I burn it or something else, like that, and that's supposed to affect the person. Or we have sympathetic magic where if something looks like something else, then if I take this, eat that food, then it will be like the other thing happens. A lot of uh, medicine in the early days was exactly that homopathic stuff. If one looks like the other, then it will behave like that. Well, you know, it doesn't really work too well. Now, I mentioned Kant I wrote a whole book, The Critique of Pure Reason, which he attempted in a big, thick volume in turgid German. Uh, just how is it we know what we know, and we've abandoned that. In fact, I think there is probably is not a red-hot theory of how you can know anything for sure. And I can give you an example of a thing that I've used a few times when somebody said, he was certain of something. I say, you're absolutely certain, no doubt. No doubt. I said, fine. Will you sign a sheet paper that if you are wrong, you'll first turn all, all your money over to me, and two, you'll commit suicide? <laughs> Suddenly, they're unwilling to do this. I said, but you were certain. Well, they begin to waffle. And I think you can see why. If I ask something you were absolutely certain, I ask that, you say, well, but, but, well maybe I'm not absolutely certain. You're familiar with any number of religious sects who've thought the world was coming to an end, they went, sold all their goods, went up the mountain, and uh, the world didn't end, and they came back down and had to start again. It's happened many times. It's happened quite a few times in my life. Various groups have done this. They were sure the world was going to end, and it didn't. They were sure of this and that, and it didn't. I'm working around to trying to convince you there isn't any certain knowledge. Now let's look at more what science does. I told you it really has theory before it measures. Let's see what it does also. It makes some experiments and gets some results. It tries to form a theory, a formula typically, which will cover these cases. But no finite number of cases can guarantee the next one. Mathematicians have a thing called math induction, which if you make a lot of other assumptions, then you can prove it will always happen. But there are a lot of different assumptions first, about logic, about various other things. Yes, mathematicians can, in that very artificial situation, prove a formula is true for all integers, but uh, you can't expect the physicist to prove that it will always happen. No matter how many times you drop a ball, there's no guarantee the next physical thing you have will drop, because you know better. If I'm holding a balloon, I'll let go, it goes up. So you have a quick alibi, oh, but everything falls except that, and you have to get around the thing. Science is full of that kind of business. Very, very full of it. So you have a problem that's not easy to cope with. Now I want, I, oh, I don't think that's what I want. Let me see. Now when we try and examine what you know, we're generally forced to use words, and these words, you see, may not have the meaning you think they have. Various people may not mean by the same thing by the same word, which you can discover sometimes. One of the ways of disposing of an argument, when you have two people in a laboratory arguing about this or that, is to slow them down and make them 
more or less say what they mean by various things, and frequently you can find out they didn't mean the same thing. They were arguing about different interpretations. Then the argument shifts over, what does this mean? Whereupon, you are on much better ground. We can now argue about what the meaning is. And yes, the experiment says this, if you understand that. It says that, if you understand that. But you get it down then to words. Now, words have a very, very bad business. Our languages, as far as I know, all the ones, tend to emphasize yes or no, black or white, true or false. But, as I told you in the other lecture, we are beginning to realize that uh, there's a middle ground. Some people are tall, some people are short, and some people are neither tall nor short. There's a middle ground. But our language does not accommodate this well, and since we tend to think in terms of words, we have trouble thinking. There were philosophers who maintained that you thought only in terms of words. There was a long school which said, you, we think in terms of words. That's why we want to give this child a big vocabulary so it has more possibility of thinking. But I suspect you've all had the experience of knowing something and you couldn't put it into words. So we don't really think in words, we tend to. And indeed what tends to happen is, say you have a vacation and you come home and now you tell somebody what happened. Gradually, the vacation you had tends to become the words you tell somebody. The words tend to replace the event and freeze down. Now, knowing this one time, when I witnessed an act, automobile accident, I spoke to the two people, I gave them my name and address, and we, my wife and I went on down shopping, we went on home, and then, without discussing anyone, I wrote down as best I could what I thought. I did not try to put in words and then let the words become the event. I tried my best to let the event take the words. Because I'm well aware that once you say something, then it seems to be stuck and you can't unsay it. It seems to make the thing, as I said, your vacation becomes the words you said it was. Very, very much. Much more than you may be inclined to believe. So sometimes you should be hesitant about talking. Now another thing which came out in the lecture on quantum mechanics was that even if I have a bunch of data in science, there may be quite different explanations. There were there's three or four different theories of quantum mechanics, all which more or less account for the same phenomenon. Just as analytic geometry and Euclidean geometry pretty much cover the same thing, but you use them different ways, same thing in quantum mechanics. There is no way of getting to a unique theory from a set of data. And since the data is finite, you're stuck with it. You aren't going to have it. In fact, you're never going to have it. I cited to you one time, uh, earlier in these lectures, the common sentence, what's more sure than one plus one is two? And my reply was, you remember in coding theory, Hamming says one plus one is zero. There isn't that certain knowledge when you wish you had. Now, let me check some other ones. Let me take our boy Galileo, who is supposed to have started science. And he's supposed to have found out that falling bodies fall the way they do. Independent, they have a constant rate acceleration. Of course, uh, this constant uh, friction and air drag affect them, but ideally in a vacuum, everything falls at the same speed. And I picture Galileo sitting here, got a heavy ball, a light ball, and he says, oh, everybody knows heavy balls fall faster than light. He said, well, a heavy one is falling, it's supposed it breaks in two. Well, it breaks in two, both pieces will slow down to their appropriate speed. But now when they're falling, suppose one happens to touch the other. Will they both speed up now? Because they're one body? If touching doesn't work, suppose I tie them together with a string. Will two bodies tied together with a string fall as fast as the combined weight, or will they fall with their separate weights? If not a string, how about a rope? How about a set of rope glue? When are two bodies one body? How does this body know what speed to fall with? The more he thought about it, the more it was obviously an idiotic question. He says, well, it must be that all bodies fall at the same speed. Otherwise, I have this idiotic question, how does a body know how heavy it is? Now remember he was raised on medieval scholasticism like you are not. 
And that's quite the tendency you can expect him to have done. And you can see he found that way. Now later on you make experiments to see if you're right, but you can see why in some sense that law isn't really a physical law. It's some kind of a verbal logical law based on the fact that you don't like to face the question, when are two bodies one? It doesn't make sense how a body knows how heavy it is, whether it's two bodies or one. Therefore, everything has to fall at the same rate. And if you look at relativity and read the original papers, both the special and general, uh, you will find there's an enormous amount of theology and very little of actual, what you would normally consider science. Enormous amount of theology, appallingly so. So science is a very strange thing and it doesn't really say anything. As I said one time in a course on digital filters lectures, we always see things through a window. The window is not only a material window in the sense that we only get certain frequencies through, but it's an intellectual window. We're only prepared to accept certain kinds of ideas. And we're stuck. Nevertheless, we make out pretty well. How can it be? Well, I suggest the process of coming to belief of what science can and cannot do is pretty much like the child learns a language. The child makes an assumption that this is the meaning of what she's been hearing, and one day she's corrected to this. We try some experiments, and they don't quite work, and we're corrected to another interpretation of what we've been seeing. And just as a child gets pretty well near a reasonable view of life and what language is, so do the experimentalists. Grad uh, theoreticians in physics get to some view that's somewhat <coughs> consistent. But it is not guaranteed to be correct. Indeed, I point out to you the very obvious fact. All previous theories that we've had in science have been proven to be wrong. We've changed them to the present ones. Is it reasonable to think that we now arrive at a date when there'll be no further revisions of science? Hardly. It suggests that Almost all the theories we now have will be shown to be, in some sense, false. In the sense that classical mechanics was shown to be false, because when you got small, it was quantum mechanics. When you got very large, it was relativity. But the middle ground where we tested it, it still was probably the best tool we had. But our philosophical view of the thing was very different. So we make progress in a strange way. But there's also a thing which is not thought about is logic, because you're not given much in logic. I think I told you that uh, the average mathematician getting a PhD sooner or later finds himself having to patch up the proof that some famous mathematician made, like Gauss's proof of the uh, roots of a polynomial, a polynomial degree and has n roots. A graduate student would never get a degree without fixing up a much tighter proof than Gauss gave. Yes, Gauss was one of the great mathematicians. We have a rising standard of rigor. We have a changing attitude toward rigor. We're beginning to recognize that logic is not the safe thing we thought it was. It's got as many pitfalls as anything else. The laws of logic, the way you tend to think, the way you should reason, like yes or no, a thing either is or is not, we're not on the stone tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. There are human assumptions which work pretty well many times, but they don't always work. And in quantum mechanics, you can't say a particle is either a particle or a wave. It's either and both, or it's neither. We've had to back down enormously from what we would like to have, but still we go on. What we should always be saying is, at present, science believes this, not that science has proved. But that kind of circumlocution is rather long and tiresome, and people who generally look at the question pretty well recognize that we don't, and we never will. But we can do like the child, get better and better, and eliminate more and more contradictions as time goes on. But is it ever evident this child will perfectly understand everything they've heard and not have such confusions as that? No. For the more written sentences can be interpreted in various ways at times. It's quite surprising. 
Now we have, you're living in an age with uh, science nominally being dominant, but in fact not terribly so. Most newspapers, even Vogue magazine, every month Vogue magazine puts up uh, astrology. If you were born such such a day, so and so and so. I think that almost all scientists reject astrology most of the time, although uh, many of us are well aware that the moon does have an effect on life on Earth, very much so, because it produces tides and various other things. But we're a little dubious about whether a star 25 light years away is there or there, you're going to be left-handed or right-handed. We're rather dubious about that because we observe that people born at the same time under the exact same stars behave quite differently and have lives which are quite different. So it can't be that the stars determine too much. They might determine some. We don't really know. We don't believe it. We have a society which depends upon science and engineering to a great extent, and perhaps too much. When Kennedy said we're going to get the moon in 10 years, there were a great many strategies to adopt. One would have been to put your money into churches and pray the people to the moon. Another would be to put your money into ESP so people can think their way to the moon. There are various other methods. Pyramidology, let's build pyramids and the pyramid power will move. No, we depended on crummy old engineering. Knowledge which we thought we knew, not mind, we only thought we knew, we didn't know, we depended upon it, and by golly, we got them to the moon and back. We did succeed, we depended upon that, and by and large, our society, much of the time, depends upon science, but by no means all the time. By no means. We have other things which are more important frequently. More important than engineering is human welfare. But uh, you come to it. Now you also have uh, UFOs and you have other great many things which are open to debate. I don't suppose there's anything that can be said or done which will get people to believe that there was not a very elaborate plot by the CIA to kill Kennedy. Or some people now believe that the government deliberately dropped a bomb in Oklahoma on a building to kill people, to cause trouble. Uh, people who have these beliefs can maintain, in the face of evidence, different things. We see them every place. Now, which ones you want to think are frauds, and which ones not, is not easy. I have several books on the topic of trying to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. Uh, you've lived through a couple of them. You probably lived through polywater, and you certainly lived through uh, cold fusion. Great claims are made. Is there anything left? Not much. From the claims originally made, very little. Well, you saw the same thing in artificial intelligence. You see constantly tremendous claims made about what machines will do in artificial intelligence, but you don't see the result. You haven't seen them yet. No one can prove that it will not happen tomorrow. Since I claim nobody can prove anything in science, I have to admit myself that I cannot prove anything. I can't prove that I can't prove it. That's obviously circular, right? There are very great limitations. We find it convenient to believe things, but we need a great deal of humility, particularly the thing I've said several times to you. And I illustrate it by the story of the fast Fourier transform, which is embarrassing to say the least. I told you that I was first told essentially the ideas, and I could have done them. In fact, I carried them out to a great extent, but found out that the uh, butterfly steps which occur in either way you do it, uh, would be impractical with equipment I had, namely card program calculators. Later on, when I'm, it's mentioned again, I merely remember it can't be done. I forget that the technology has changed. I now got an internally programmed machine. I damn well could have done it. What we can do and what we cannot do is constantly changing. Our knowledge of science, everything else is constantly changing. What can't be done today can be done tomorrow, but also the opposite is true. What we think we did today, when we look closer tomorrow, was not true. It goes both ways. Now, let's go on about science. Science has had a period from 1650 to now, about 
oh, well, let's say 1,700 to now, uh, 300 years, which has been vastly dominant. It's been expanding in many, many areas. Now, the basic thing of science has been what we call reductionism. I can take the thing apart into pieces, I can analyze the pieces, and understand the whole. I've told you before, the many religious people claim you can't do this. You can't look at pieces of God and try to understand God. You have to do it all, totally. The psychologists, the Gestalt psychologists said, you have to look at the whole situation as a whole. You cannot take the parts apart and not destroy it. That the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And that the classical techniques will not work in many areas. Therefore, you have to contemplate the question, has science, to a fair extent, exhausted the general areas of which it can get results? After all, a problem very anxious to the Greeks, truth, beauty, and justice. Has science added anything? No. We know no more about those ideas now than we did then. I believe I told you, Hammurabi in 1900-something uh, B.C., 1950 B.C., wrote the Code of Hammurabi, which you may remember as eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and such other things. That was an attempt to put justice into words. Well, anybody watching the trial down in Los Angeles at present will conclude that you are not seeing justice, you're seeing legalities. We have been unable to put justice into words, and the attempt to do so has produced legalities. We have been unable to put into words truth, I'm trying hard to do it in this lecture, but I can't really do it. Nor can we do beauty. We just can't. Now, of course, our boy uh, Keats said, uh, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, and that's all you can know on earth and all you need to know. Well, that's a poet. But he identified truth and beauty as being the same thing. Uh, it's not satisfactory from a scientific point of view. But I suggest to you that science is giving you a hard time. I want to summarize the talk and we can quit early and go home on a Friday. Uh, science just does not produce a certain knowledge we wish we had. Our difficulty is mainly we wish we could have certain truths so we assume that we have it. Wishful thinking is one of the biggest curses man has to put up with. We wish something is true. We so, and I've seen it work at Bell Labs. You know, it's possible that we could, with no new evidence, say, you know, we might be able to do that. You know, oh, well, let's try and do it. And pretty soon people believe it can be done without one whit of more evidence. They simply talk more and more and more, and desirability results shifts them to believing that well, might be possibly true, maybe fantastically, to believe, oh, well, sure, it's almost true. It's a trait that humans have. You put into what you want to believe, and we want to believe we can have truth, so we constantly assert we have truth, and we know what we're talking about. Well, we don't, as I said in this talk. I don't believe it in the slightest. Science can actually say very little about things that you care about. Not only truth, beauty, and justice, but all kinds of other things. Science isn't going to do much. I don't think it can. Reductionism is one thing. Furthermore, the two features science has used in the past, breaking down the small parts which are loosely interconnected, or high repetition, the same thing as we do in statistical mechanics, we have some methods of coping. But in between, we don't. And that's roughly what we ourselves seem to look like. And I think the biology is in for an enormous amount more trouble than they think they are. I think they're producing all kinds of results. So just yesterday, reading in science, uh, Already, some of the results that were supposed to have been produced by some geneticists are being denied by some other geneticists as to what the cause is. They can't even agree on that. So we're not really there, and we're not likely to be there. Well, I want to say something about the course, and the last lecture will be Tuesday, and it's on you and your research, but it might as well be called just you and your life. I'll stick to you and your research because that's why I started and that's the thing I've studied most. I've given for many, many years. Very popular talk. You can say in some sense this course is simply an elaboration of that. 
or alter you can say that that talk next Tuesday is a summary of the whole course. It's an attempt to set out better than is generally done what you should do given, I claim, one life to lead. How is a sensible thing to do? Now, nobody told me these things. I had to find most of them for myself. My claim will be at the end of the talk Tuesday that me having told you now how to do it, you ought to be able to do much better than I did. So I'll see you Tuesday.